siblings in the spirit, wherever you are, here for an hour or a lifetime, welcome to this household of grace. Here, where we grow together in community, and belonging. Sisters and brothers, in the spirit, come gather in. We gather here, where God heals the to join God in the world. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship at First Church in Cambridge. Welcome friends in person and friends online. Welcome whoever you are and whoever you love. Welcome whoever your race, class, age, ability. Welcome to who, to those of all gender identities and prolong. Welcome if you feel settled in your questions. Welcome if you feel wherever you are on this journey of faith. We are all insiders here because we are all beloved children of God. Indeed, there is room for us all in this household of God. My name is Devin Hansen, and I've been coming to First Church in Cambridge since 1992 when I came for college. In the past, First Church has been a pillar for me, not only when I was away from my parents for the first time, but continuing now through every time I have an issue. I have served in the past as a Sunday school teacher and am now serving through the Friday Cafe. And now let us continue in worship and song. No.
Beloved, we turn to God full of our own frailties, mindfulness, and the heavy history we carry, and of our own fallings to live up to whatever we know is possible for us in and with God. So let us take time now to be honest and vulnerable with God and with one another and with ourselves. In silence, prayer, we place our full selves, faithful souls, and sinfulness before God and open hearts, trusting in God's wisdom, mercy, and grace. Let us pray for healing, pardon, and peace. We confess, we confess that we have seen from your path, thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Friends, receive this good news with joy. There's nothing on earth or in heaven that can be separated from you, from the love of God and Jesus Christ. God knows you, God loves you, and scripture says God delights in you. And so I proclaim that we are forbidden people, each and all of us, May this trust find a home in your heart today as we re reconciling to God. We are called to be a community of reconciliation, and so I say, the peace of Christ be with you. Please offer the peace of Christ to others. Oh, is he? In just a moment, I want you to join me in blessing our children as they go off to their learning hour. And we are going to say, may God be with you there. And they will respond with, and God be with you here. So please join me. May God be with you there. Amen.
And as we turn now to God's ancient and yet vibrant word for us, let us pray. Spirit of God, in our reading of scripture, may your word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the response of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. The first reading for today is from the book of Psalms, and we are going to read it together aloud. Uh, I want you to note that we will have pauses after each one of the lines in the psalm. And I just want to say as well, before we have two readings from the psalms today, and I just want to note that, of course, the psalms, I guess, are often called the song book of the Bible. But along with being the song book of the Bible, they are the prayer book of the Bible. It is prayers so often that are put to music. And so this is indeed a prayer that in many ways reveals one of the most important features of our faith. That is that through scripture and through the life of people like us in a congregation, we're willing to be honest about life. The difficult and the joyful, the full experience. And this psalm so clearly shows that. So if you would join me again, note the pause after each line, and then try to join in really quickly as I begin the next line. Let us read Psalm 13 together. How long, O oh God, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my anguish and wallow in despair all day long? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look at me. Answer me, my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemy say, I have prevailed, lest my foes rejoice when I fall. Thanks be to God for this prayer. It's important that the raw honesty and vulnerability, even the bleakness of Psalm 13, is not the final word about our lives. As the Psalms dare to despair, they also dare to hope as we hear them now in Psalm 34. I sought God who answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to God are radiant, and their faces are never covered in shame. The poor calls out the Holy One, heard and saved them from all their troubles. God's angel encamps around those who re revenge God and rescues them. Taste and see that God is good. Happiness comes to those who take refuge in God. Holy people of God, reserve the Almighty for those who stand in awe of God's fear nothing. The young lion may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek God will lack no things.
And a final reading from the book of Revelation. Um, I don't know if any of you have this response, but oftentimes when people hear about the book of Revelation, they think, oh my gosh, he's going to talk about monsters and, and blood and blah, all that terrible stuff at the end of the world. Um, the book of Revelation is not really about the end of the world in like a temporal sense. But it is about the end of the world as in the ends of the world, the goal of the world, the goal of the world to be reconciled again to God. And this passage comes very near the end of the book of Revelation where, where the angel delivers to John a vision of what that ultimate reconciliation with God might look like. And so from the 22nd chapter of Revelation. And the messenger of God showed me a river with the water of life, clear and bright as crystal, coming forth from the throne of God and the Lamb, flowing right through the city street. And on either side of the river were trees producing a full harvest of fruit each month. And the leaves of those trees are for a healing of the nations. And no longer will there be anything accursed. And the throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. And, the, and God's servants will worship God and they will see the face of God who will claim them as God's very own. And there will be no more night. And the blessed will have no need of lantern or sun because the Almighty God will shine upon them and they will reign ages upon ages without end. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Blessed God, thank you for these words of life. May my words now reflect your word for us here in this place and time with all we bring to this gathering today, our hopes and fears, gratitude and anxieties, our vitality and our need for healing. May your spirit dwell in us richly through your word. Amen. Now, today is our Healing Sunday here at First Church, and I actually don't know the background very much. I don't know if you're used to hearing a little bit of a message to go along with the healing, but I am going to offer one today. I hope you will receive it with grace, even if it pushes us a little bit past the hour later on. And perhaps you've heard this story before, but even so, it's worth hearing again. Uh, it comes from Tony Campolo, who is a Baptist pastor um, who is evangelical enough to believe in the healing power of prayer and progressive enough to believe that it's a grave mistake for the evangelical right to follow Donald Trump. Campolo tells a story about leading a revival. There's a sign of evangelicalism, right? He leads a revival at a church in Oregon where he was asked to pray for a man who had cancer. Campolo prayed boldly for the man's healing and he anointed him with oil. And the next week, he got a telephone call from the man's wife. She said, you prayed for my husband. He had cancer. Campolo thought when he heard this woman's voice and indeed her tone of voice and that she used the past tense to refer to the cancer, that his prayer had worked a miracle and the man's cancer had been eradicated. But before he could even 
clarify these thoughts in his mind, she added, he died. Campolo felt terrible, he reports, but he continued, she continued, the woman, don't feel bad. When he came into the church that Sunday, he was filled with anger. He knew that he was going to be dead in a short period of time, and he hated God. He was 58 years old, and he wanted to see his children and his grandchildren grow up. He was angry that this all-powerful God didn't take away his sickness and heal him. He would lie in bed and curse God. The more his anger grew towards God, the more miserable he was to everyone around him. It was an awful thing to be in his presence, this woman said to Tony Campolo. But then she continued, after you prayed for him, a peace had come over him and a joy had come into him. Tony, the last three days of his life were among the best that we've ever had together. We sang, we laughed, we read scripture, we prayed. They were wonderful days. And I just called to thank you for anointing him and praying for his healing. And then she said something incredibly profound. She said, he wasn't cured, but he was healed. That's what we hope for at this service of healing. We pray and anoint, not to cure so much as to heal not to fix so much as to make whole. And isn't wholeness what we all need most in life? I've had all too many conversations through the years with people who have been recently diagnosed with cancer or perhaps some other progressive illness, and I don't think that I've ever heard someone say in those conversations, the thing I fear most is the physical suffering that I'm about to go through. What they say, rather, is I'm so sad that I might miss out on more days with my loved ones, my family, my dear friends. Sometimes they say there is so much more that I want to do and experience. It's all about missing out. It's all about loss. The implication is that their life somehow won't be whole. And they long for wholeness. Now, of course, every illness doesn't carry a reasonable risk of death, but it's amazing, isn't it, how fast our minds go there? I had a medical test a couple years ago, a, a test result that came back uh, with a result that showed that, you know, worst case scenario, I had bladder cancer. Uh, two days later, I learned that it was nothing, but those two days were filled with worry. Worry about not having a full life. Worry about my life not being whole. Maybe you'll come forward in a bit when we invite you for a prayer and anointing with oil. Maybe you'll remain in the pews, but we all need healing. We all need wholeness. Illness might make that clearer. It might make us think more about our need for healing, but need it, we all do. Whether the wholeness that you seek 
today, whether you come forward or not later on, whether the wholeness you seek is in the bodily realm, the relational realm, the social realm, the spiritual realm, whether it's in the realm of your soul, it's all about your soul, yourself. In our ritual, we use anointing oil, and that oil is a visible sign, in some traditions even a sacrament, that oil is a visible sign of the wholeness that comes from God. In the Christian tradition, oil carries many different meanings and nuances, but the one that strikes me with the most resonance today is the sheer extravagance of it. In scripture, the oil represents abundance, superfluity, nemiety, wholeness. Think of Psalm 23. Maybe it echoes in your mind. You anointed my head with oil, and the line that follows immediately is my cup overflows. Extravagance, fullness, wholeness. There is so much. There is completeness. The oil that we use shows us that no matter what is going on in our bodies or our lives, we can be whole because of the, because the extravagant wholeness that comes from being a precious child of God. Now, this is not to deny hardship or suffering. Those things don't just poof, magically go away. When someone is going through a difficult time for whatever reason it is involving body or relationship or mind or soul, my first response is, well, that sucks. Now, I might try to word it a little more delicately in the midst of the conversation, depending on who I'm speaking to, but that's really what it is. That sucks. More biblically, that would be the words that we read together earlier from Psalm 13. Oh God, how long? How long will you forget me? Acknowledging that pain is important. But tenderly, hopefully, I also say today that that cry is not the last word. In John's vision of the restored creation in the 22nd chapter of Revelation, there is this grove of trees standing alongside the water, the river with the water of life, and those trees whose roots are fed, nourished by that water. The leaves of those trees are for the healing of the nations. That, my friends, is God's final word for all of us. That the ointment, if you will, that comes from the leaves of those trees is for the healing of the nations, of us and all people. Yeah, there's a lot that sucks in this world. We live with it, some of us, every single day. And yet that's not the final word. The final word is represented by that oil, that extravagance, that, that completeness, that wholeness that is a sign of the love of God for us and this world always. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, we know that this wonderful world is also a world of sorrow, and that each of us bears a burden that is sometimes too heavy to carry alone. 
Today, we wish to offer you a time of blessing and consolation, a time to renew your faith in God's promise of wholeness and well-being for all people, and indeed for all creation. This is an opportunity to share what is on your heart with two people ready to hold you and for you to receive a gentle word, a touch of soothing, extravagant oil, and a reassuring hand, all signs of God's gifts of peace and hope. Some of you may wish not to come forward during this time. As you remain seated, please take in the music and have some time for personal reflection. Pray for the world, for others, and for yourselves. Whether you remain seated or you come forward or you come to the station in the back, whether you ask aloud or silently within your hearts, God knows your need. And God comes to us all with hope, with healing, and with peace. And so now will our deacons please come forward. And I'll ask you to hold the oil as we get ready to bless our hands. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, giver of life, bless our hands and make them ready to serve our neighbors who seek your consolation today. May we lay them gently upon one another as a sign of the love of Jesus, whose healing hands were wounded for our sake and have become for us a fount of endless mercy and peace. Bless also this oil that your good earth has yielded, rich fruit of ancient trees. With oil, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed, and the wounds of many were mended in your name. Create rest for us in its soothing touch, as Jesus once rested under the olive trees to dream a world of healing for all nations where pain would be no more, and all manner of things would be well. Amen. Amen. And so we go to our healing station.
Let us pray. Most blessed God, for the life stories that have just been revealed among us, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the healing prayers, for the extravagant oil that we have placed upon people's foreheads and upon their lives. Whether they came forward or not, gracious God, we know that each of us needs your healing, your wholeness in our lives, and we pray that you will bless our vulnerability in being honest about that, and that vulnerability may lead to the reception of your spirit, which can fully and wholly fill our lives. Thank you that we are able to be a community of honesty, a community of the fullness of life, that we can have this time together. And we pray as Jesus himself taught us, our healer who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. by the beauty of witnessing what we witness together. So let's just take a deep breath. And it's my joy to share some announcements. Um, welcome again to each and every one of you. It's so important that each of you is here, whether you've been here for 20 years, 30 years, or two days, or two hours. It's so special to have you. Thank you for being here. Um, if you are new, please fill out a pew card. You'll find them in the back of many of the pews um, so that we can follow up with you and weave you into life in this church. Um, everybody is welcome. All of us will migrate at the end of the service towards Hastings Common, which is where you found coffee before the service to share some fellowship together. So please come and join us there after the service. Another really special thing is happening after the service at 1230. There will be a family choir practice in the chapel with Sarah. And I talked to her this morning. She said, family choir doesn't mean that it's like just kids and parents, like first church family. It means come one, come all, come anybody of any age. Come if you feel like you're a great singer. Come if you feel like you're really not comfortable singing and you're terrible at it. Everyone is welcome for this family choir rehearsal. Um, and you're going to practice a song that we'll get to share together at All Saints Sunday the first weekend of November. So meet Sarah in the chapel at 12.30 if you're interested in that. Um, also happening today, the young adults are going apple picking, which is going to be awesome. <laughs> if you identify as a young adult and you'd like to join, <laughs> go find Phil after the service. Okay, I think there's some more room to join them today. So, so fun. And we wish you delicious apples and pot potentially some cider donuts. I've got my fingers crossed for you. Um, next week, the Doris Bouvet Luncheon and Mitch Snyder Awards are happening after church. This is the shelter's biggest event of the year, um, and it's a chance when the shelter really gets to honor um, people in the community doing good work. So please plan to stay. All are welcome after church. We'll have lunch together and get to celebrate some people in our community doing important and good work. And I think that's it for announcements. So we'll continue with our invitation to offering. What is our response to grace and peace that God offers us? Friends, let us honor God with grateful hearts, knowing that nothing belongs to us alone. All that we are 
and all that we have is to be shared. Let us do that. Do so now with joy and freedom in our hearts. The morning offering will now be given and graciously received. God bless these offerings today so they might help us nourish each other and join you as you work for justice and compassion in our world, touching the whole, whole of your creation with grace, love, and new life. Amen.
At the end of this benediction, we invite you, as is our custom here at First Church, to be seated and to have a final moment to be filled with the wholeness of God as it is presented to us in the voluntary. And then at that point, may you indeed leave this place with the anointing of God, with wholeness in your life, whatever form that wholeness, that fullness needs to take. And as you do so, may the grace, mercy, and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. Thank you.